But anyway, I want you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Luke, chapter 11. Luke 11 is where we're going to begin. Luke 11, and I'm going to ask you to begin reading, as I read, at verse 29. Luke 11, and begin with verse 29. And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet, or Jonah. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South shall rise up in judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh shall rise up in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Uh, at Easter time, it seems as though we're almost forced to spend extra time dwelling on the sign of the prophet Jonah. Uh, Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights. And uh, the Lord Jesus said he would be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And um, most Christianity has... Have, have proven themselves monumentally ignorant of the scriptures. They've been believing the Roman Catholic lie for generations that Jesus died on Good Friday, rose Easter Sunday morning, and somehow you can squeeze three days and three nights into that time frame. You cannot. But uh, people would rather hang on to the three-day weekend or, or some such justification and believe what's false than to simply read the Bible and believe the Bible. Jesus did not die on Good Friday. He didn't resurrect uh, just before sunrise, Easter Sunday morning. But be that as it is, um, we believe Jesus Christ is alive right now. Right? And without boasting, he would nevertheless offer um, statements about himself to let people know that he was the promised Messiah. He was the deliverer of Israel. He was the ultimate forgiver of men's sins. Um, they asked him in John chapter 6, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? What a great question. And who better to ask it of than the Lord Jesus? And Jesus said, this is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. John 6, 29, meaning himself. And uh, he told the Samaritan woman at the well, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. John 4, verse 10. According to John three sixteen, Jesus Christ was the gift of God. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Um... Here in our text, he also says in verse 31, The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with, this, with the men of this generation and condemn them, for she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And that's the title of my sermon this morning. Got fat fingers, excuse me. Um, Solomon was one of the most remarkable men in human history. But when compared to the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ, his greatness pales in comparison. There really is no comparison between the glory of Solomon and the glory of the Lord Jesus. None whatsoever. First of all, let me say this. Solomon was the son of a great king, but Jesus Christ is the son of God. His father, King David, was the most famous and beloved king in Israel's history. In fact, so beloved that 
modern day skeptics and Bible critics have maintained that there really was no King David in Israel's history. They, they say they can't find evidence for King David. It's hard to imagine someone being so well beloved and so successful as a king as David was that the so-called experts and even some archaeologists have claimed they can find no trace of evidence or proof for the existence of the life of King David. But until just recently, you may have read these headlines in the paper, they are now beginning to find and unearth artifacts that coincide with the reign of King David and the lifetime of King David. The story of David and Goliath is famous around the world, and it's used by advertisers to promote various campaigns, the little guy versus the big corporation or some such um, reference. The King David Hotel in Jerusalem is still one of the most famous hotels in that nation. But David came from obscurity, um, tending his father's sheep as a shepherd and son of Jesse, minding his own business. Uh, but he slew Goliath of Gath, a giant of the Philistines, nine and a half feet tall when compared with modern measurements. Um, and to this day, that story is known around the world, David and Goliath. Um, it was one of the greatest foreshadows of the Lord Jesus Christ who would slay the, um, the giant of sin and the giant of Satan and the giant of the flesh and the giants of the world for the sake of the sinner. Thank God for that. But David was preoccupied with defending the nation against her enemies. He was unable to build the temple of God as he had, as he had desired. Uh, he nevertheless began uh, gathering materials that would be used for the temple. God gave him a son uh, whose reign would be one that enjoyed peace. In fact, the name Solomon means peaceable. And, um, and th thus freeing him to uh, focus his attention on the temple. But Solomon was the son of a great king. We read in... Um, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Excuse me. Solomon's father, David, reigned 40 years from an earthly throne of glory uh, and fame. But Jesus, Heavenly Father, reigns from an eternal throne of power that cannot be matched by anything here on the earth, nor can it be measured by any uh, standard of measurement that men could devise. How can the finite measure the infinite? How can the limited measure the unlimited? And um, God, the, the, the God of the Bible, is outside of time and space. Uh, as the creator of those things, he's not bound or limited by any of those uh, elements. Ezekiel writes, Ezekiel 21, verses 25 to 27, And thou, profane, wicked prince of Israel, whose day is come, when iniquity shall have an end, thus saith the Lord God, Remove the diadem and take off the crown. This shall not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn it, and it shall be no more until he come whose right it is, and I will give it him. God the Father reserves for himself the right to set up kings and to tear down kings. The great Nebuchadnezzar was dethroned by God until he humbled himself and recognized the God of the children of Israel. We read in Daniel 4, verses 34 and 35, And at the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand and say unto, or say unto him, What doest thou? 
Uh, Ecclesiastes uh, 8 verse 4 says, the, for the, Where the word of a king is, there is power. And who may say unto him, What doest thou? Nobody has the um, liberty to second guess or question the actions of the monarch. Solomon was a, the son of a great king, but Jesus Christ is the son of God. Secondly, let me say this, Solomon ruled as a great king, but Christ will rule as king of kings one day. God appeared to Solomon, if you will, go, go back to 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3. First Kings 3, God appeared to Solomon uh, when he was a young man, about 20 years old, and he asked him what he might desire of the Lord. And rather than asking for um, great wealth, servants, lands, the lives of his enemies, and so forth, he asked for wisdom and understanding in order to govern and lead the nation of Israel. Look at verse, 1 Kings 3 and verse 9. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad for who is able to judge this thy so great a people. And the Lord said to him down in verses uh, 12 and 13, Behold, I have done according to thy word. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. The Lord was pleased with Solomon's response, reply, uh, because he had asked those things that would help him lead and direct the nation of Israel. God said, I'll give you those things which you have not asked for as well. Notice, um, 1 Kings chapter 4. Turn over to there. 1 Kings 4. And start with me at verse 29. God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much, and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country, and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than, than all men, than Ethan the Ezraite, and Heman, and Chalcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahal, and his fame was in all nations round about. Verse 34. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom. And The Bible mentions the country of India by name twice, in Esther chapter 1 and Esther chapter 8, uh, and the land of Sinim, Isaiah 49 verse 12, which the Schofield note and nearly all commentators agree is a reference to China. The people of the ancient world knew about each other. Even if it took weeks, perhaps months, by caravan to travel from one country to the other. But they knew about each other. What they called the Silk Road was a, a, a travel route, a trade route, that stretched from China and India all the way west to the Mediterranean, 600 years before the time of Christ. And so, like I say, the people of, of uh, ancient times knew of one another. And so it is not beyond the the uh, realm of possibility that people from as far away as China and India and countries to the Far East traveled to hear the wisdom of Solomon. The Bible says those which had heard of his wisdom. So if they had heard about a great king in Palestine uh, whose magnificence, whose wealth and splendor are beyond description, uh, it's entirely possible that people that far away traveled to see for themselves uh, what was being described to them. The fame of Solomon spread throughout the world so that the Queen of the South, uh, called the Queen of Sheba, that's southern Arabia right now, uh, came to see for herself and hear the words 
uh, which he uttered uh, by his own mouth. Look at 1 Kings and chapter 10. 1 Kings 10. And let's read the first nine verses there. And when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices, and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom, and the house that he had built, and the meat of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their apparel, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up unto the house of the Lord, there was no more spear in her. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in mine own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit I believed not the words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, which stand continually before thee, and that hear thy wisdom. Blessed be the Lord thy God, which delighted in thee, and set thee on the throne of Israel, because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore made he thee king to do judgment and justice." The queen of the south had heard of the wealth and the glory of Solomon, but she had to come and see it with her own eyes. And she said, Behold, the half was not told me, thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard in verse uh, 7 there. Notice down there in verses 14 and 15. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was six hundred three score, uh, excuse me, and six talents of gold. Besides that, he had of the merchantmen and of the traffic of the spice merchants, and of all the kings of Arabia and of the governors of the country. Uh, and King Solomon made two hundred targets of beaten gold, six hundred shekels of gold went to one target, so forth and so on. Jump down to verse uh, 22. Pick up there. For the king had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes, and peacocks. Peacocks are native to India and Burma and countries as far away as those. By the way, there are also um, archaeological finds from 600, 700 BC, which depict some of the items and the animals and the beasts being trafficked, trafficked between Palestine and the Far East. And among those are the depiction of Indian elephants. And you can tell the difference by the shape of the size of the ears, uh, as opposed to African elephants. And so, like I say, they, the travel and the trade and the concourse uh, between those parts of the world uh, have uh, continued for many for a very long time. But it says there, in verse 23, So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom, and all the earth sought to Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. The Bible also says he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. 1 Kings 4, verse 32. He spoke of the natural world of trees and animals and of fishes uh, and creeping things, including spiders, lizards, and reptiles, and so forth. And he would have a total of 1,000 wives, 700 wives and 300 concubines, which would eventually be his undoing. But Solomon ruled as a great king. However, Jesus Christ will one day rule as king of kings. The Bible says, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords, Revelation 19, verse 16. When he comes back to the earth to rule it for a thousand years, he will be riding on a white horse like a true conqueror. And on his garments, down his leg, will be the words written, King of kings 
and Lord of Lords. And um, the beast um, and the armies of the earth will try to go out and wage war against him and withstand his return to the world. And he'll subdue them, a very quick, decisive battle of Armageddon. It won't be dragged out. He'll do it quickly by his power and right. Solomon reigned for 40 years as David his father had done. But Christ will reign over this earth for 1,000 years just to get started. That's a marvelous thing. And the entire universe by extension. Solomon's wealth and Solomon's glory were indescribable. The power and the glory of Christ's reign will outshine even that of Solomon's. The Bible says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Revelation 4, verse 11. The Apostle Paul wrote that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, uh, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11. Solomon ruled as a great king, but Jesus Christ will one day rule as king over all kings. Point number three today is this. Solomon had great wisdom, but Christ has perfect knowledge. Solomon had great wisdom, but Christ has perfect knowledge. As soon as he became king, and like I say, he was a young man, he was confronted with a real test of what God could do by him. There were two harlots who had both born children. Um, and uh, during the night, one of them laid on top of her baby and suffocated it. And so she switched her dead baby with the living baby of the other woman's. And of course, in the morning when sun was up, undoubtedly panic ensued and pandemonium in that household. And so they brought their case to the king to decide the matter, each one claiming the living baby is mine, the dead one is yours. And how would a king handle a problem such as that? The highest court of appeal uh, at that time. So Solomon said, bring me a sword. We'll cut the living baby in half. And the true mother said, no, 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 let the other woman have it. She, because she loved that baby, didn't want harm to come to it. And the false mother said, no, that'll be fine, divide it in half. And so Solomon could tell who the right mother was. And the expression, the wisdom of Solomon was immediately born. 20 year old young man, God was beginning to fulfill his promise to grant to Solomon wisdom and understanding. Solomon said, she's the real mother. And uh, like I say, the wisdom of the, the world has recognized Solomon as the wisest of men who ever lived outside the Lord Jesus Christ. But Christ has perfect knowledge. The Bible says, and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts, Matthew 9, verse 4. The Bible says later, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand, Matthew 12, verse 25. We read, But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man, John 2, verses 24 and 25. Solomon knew people, and he understood human nature and uh, their problems. He knew how to appeal to the natural instincts of a young man when he writes Proverbs and Ecclesiastes to his son Rehoboam. He described wisdom and goodness and virtue as a lovely woman, a beautiful woman that every young man should desire. And he described foolishness and rebellion against God as a streetwalker, a hooker on the street that every man should try to avoid. He knew how to appeal to the flesh of his own son. I mean, a guy with 700 wives and 300 concubines, he knew a little something, something about attracting the opposite sex. You know, there's that freak show going on in England right now with Prince Harry 
what, a, what an odd group of, what an odd collection of people, the royal household. My grandfather spent years studying our family's genealogy, and I'm here to tell you I am an 18th cousin twice removed to Prince Charles, which means that William and Harry are also my distant cousins, but who cares? I don't care. But a man who had a thousand wives understood something about the, 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 the nature of a young man, and he could read people. That's how Solomon's wisdom, that's what Solomon's wisdom uh, included. But Jesus not only knows the illness of the person, he knows the remedy for their sickness, for their sin. He knows how to make our hearts glad. He knows how to make our souls at peace and at rest. He knows how to, how to uh, uh, relieve fear and uncertainty in the hearts of people, make them safe once again. Solomon had great wisdom, but Jesus Christ has perfect knowledge. Point number four today, Solomon built a great temple, but Christ has prepared a heavenly home. He built a great temple, but Christ has prepared a heavenly home. David had proposed replacing the movable tabernacle with something more permanent. However, God uh, prevented him from doing so. He was a man of war, and he had been busy killing and slaying the enemies of Israel. And God said it should not be so for the man who would seek to build a house to his honor. So all David could do was gather the materials, many of the, much of the materials that would go into the temple, and then Solomon enjoyed the peace that his father, had, David, had established. People were afraid to come against the Israelites. They had a God who went, who went out, out to battle with them and fought their battles for them. And any country that had any sense about them would think twice before trying to take on the nation of Israel. And it was only because of Israel's sin and their repeated backsliding into, re into idolatry that God would send another nation to wage war against them and conquer them and subdue them. But Solomon enjoyed peace because of the victories his father David had achieved. Um, by today's economic standards, the value of Solomon's temple would not be measured in millions of dollars, but rather in billions of dollars. So much was overlaid with gold, you didn't dare stand still. They might cover you with gold. It was one of the most magnificent, magnificent structures of the ancient world. The interior was smaller than our church building. But its value in sheer materials, gold and silver, in, in a time when, when you think of gold being so prevalent that silver was sort of a secondary material, that's a lot of gold. But as our first text today says, behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Solomon built a great temple, but Christ has prepared a heavenly home. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there ye may be also. John 14, verses 1 through 3. The Apostle John had a vision of this place, Revelation 21. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 21, verse 2. And then he describes it, quote, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Revelation 21, verse 11. The streets of the city will be made of gold. It's 12 gates around the, the uh, city of made of pearls. The if the city is base uh, foundation is square, the Bible said Re Revelation 21 that the length of one side is 12,000 furlongs, approximately 1,500 miles. One side of 
the city of New Jerusalem. So it's, and the Bible never describes New Jerusalem as landing on the earth. So it may, it may be very unlikely that it actually attaches itself to the earth. It certainly won't fit into the city limits of Independence, Missouri, as the Mormons have proposed many years ago. That's not where New Jerusalem will be situated. No need for any temple there. The Lord God is the temple thereof. No need for the sun or moon to shine in it, for the Lamb uh, of God himself is the light thereof. And we read, There shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Revelation 21, verse 27. New Jerusalem will be the home of the saved children of God the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ. The city of New Jerusalem will be the dwelling place of the saints one day. Um, and to go along with that, the Bible says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle, these bodies were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, 2 Corinthians 5, 1. Your body is going to decay and deteriorate one day if God delays his coming. Uh, but God promises to give you a new body, one glorified and resurrected, uh, incorruptible and invincible and immortal, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, like the glorified, resurrected body of Christ himself. Solomon died and went to his eternal destiny. And the truth is, we don't know where that was. Solomon's heart had turned away from the Lord God because of all the wives that had corrupted him, uh, tempting him to worship their idols, their idols. And we don't read of him ever repenting or getting right with God. So we'll have to wait until eternity to find out the ultimate destiny of Solomon. Jesus Christ died and was buried, and he rose again in glory and in glorified form to give new life to those who will trust in him. I'm so glad that on November 5th, 1967, I was six years old. My father was standing at this place preaching one Sunday morning. And at the end of his service, um, he gave an invitation. I was sitting right there in the front row. My mom was sitting right behind me to smack me in the head if I misbehaved. Well, when he gave the invitation, for the first time in my life, I knew I was a sinner. And I didn't want to go to hell because of my sin. And if God has a right to judge, he has a, certainly has a right to judge me. What does a six-year-old know about sin? I knew I had disobeyed my dad and mom. And I could figure out that that qualified as sin. And so I walked from there to here, right in front of the pulpit, and gave my heart to Christ and asked God to forgive me. And I've got to tell you, I've told you this so many times, you're probably tired of hearing it. It's the most vivid memory of my childhood. The day I was born again. And all I could cry uh, was, God, forgive me, forgive me. And I'm sure my father talked to me later to make sure I understood what I was doing. And I don't remember that conversation. I remember what happened, though, when I was on my knees right there. That's been... Over 50 years that I've been saved, which is good when I'm only 37 years old, but, but I haven't forgotten it. It's stayed with me ever since. And um, truly, a greater than Solomon has been here, and a greater than Solomon is coming again. He came meek and lowly at his first coming. At his second coming, he will come in glory and power. The first time he came, he came riding upon an ass. The second time he will come on a great white horse. The first time he came alone. The second time he will come uh, with saints and angels and glorified form. The, next time, the first time he came, he wore a crown of thorns. The next time he will wear many crowns of splendor. The first time he came, he was mocked as the king of the Jews. The next time he will come not only as the king of the Jews, but the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the king of the universe. 
He came the first time with no money of his own. The next time he'll come and own everything that exists. There is nothing in all of known reality that does not belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. The first time he came, the people jeered and they taunted him. He saved others himself he cannot save and so forth. The next time they will tremble and fear. Nobody's going to be making smart aleck remarks at the second coming of Jesus Christ. If they even live, they'll be on their face trembling in fear, waiting for their ultimate judgment. The first time he came, he was hanged upon a cross of shame and dishonor and humiliation. The second time, he will sit upon a throne. Woo! Ruling, ruling the universe. Ruling this world and the universe by extension. The first time he came, he had nails in his hands. The second time, he will rule with a rod of iron. The first time he came, he was judged by Pilate. The next time, he will be the judge. The first time he came as a lamb. The lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The next time, he will come as the righteous lion of the tribe of Judah. And govern this world as it should have always been governed. And set things right that have been made wrong because of sin and the sinful natures of men. And he'll set it all right once again. I'm glad I know him. I'm glad I know him now. If someone says, well, you have to, during the tribulation, you have to make sure you don't take the mark of the beast. You have to make sure you don't worship the Antichrist. I'm not worried about that. I'm saved right now. I'm not looking for the... Uh, you know, undertaker, I'm waiting for the upper taker. Now, the undertaker may get me, but not for very long. I am an undertaker. <laughs> but we're not going to take everybody. One of these days, the, the words, come up hither, will echo through the universe. And every child of God who has ever trusted Christ as their Savior will go up into heaven and be with him. While hell on earth ensues. All right, let's bring this to a close. A greater than Solomon is here, and a greater than Solomon has come, and he's coming again. 